Hi again, Mark here from TalkingBass.net. This week, I'm going to be giving the first of a small series of lessons on creating bass lines. Now, you might have already seen the lesson series on bass riffs. I'm going to be dividing bass line creation into two separate topics of study. Bass riffs, as I've just mentioned, and bass lines. Now, this bass line subject is devoted more to creating bass lines from a longer linear perspective rather than the short repetitive motif or hook style of riffs. So we'll be looking at different styles of bass line, some tips of adding uh, interest to a line, and how to weave an independent melodic line through a chord progression. So let's start with the basics. There's many reasons why we might be uh, making up a bass line. We could be writing a song or an instrumental piece, either on our own or as part of a band, or we might be playing a cover song with a band and uh, you know working through a chord chart or a written part that might allow for some creativity from you. If the song has no important bass riffs to play or sections where we might double a melodic line, it can be left to us to create something on the fly that fits with the style and the feel and the beat. Many professional gigs involve working through chord charts and simply generating something that works and feels right. So unless we're just starting a composition from scratch and writing it on bass, a lot of the time when we come up with a bass line, some other aspects of the tune will always be predetermined. For a start, the tempo and the feel are probably already decided, as is the key, and some of the more important uh, instrumental sides of the arrangement, like the drum beat and the chord progression. So let's say that we've been given or um, we've written a chord chart that looks something like this. This is the basic verse, pre-chorus and chorus of a song written in slash notation. Sometimes you'll get a lead sheet with a melody and chords, but we're just looking at a really basic chord sheet and we'll just deal with these three sections for the sake of time. So first of all, we'll just try coming up with something really basic that works. It's going to be a simple, medium tempo, straight pop feel with no syncopated accents or anything like that. The guitar or keys will be playing a very basic comp pattern like this. Before we even play a single note, we want to know what the rhythmic pattern is that we're going to be using for the bass line. So the first part of call is always going to be the bass drum. Okay, so um, let's have a listen to the bass drum. We'll listen to the uh, drum beat in isolation. So there the bass drum is on one, the and of two, and three. So we've got one, two, and three. One, two, and three. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. So if I was gonna play that pattern on the bass, so I'll just take it on a C. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four, okay? So now let's play through that whole progression, just sticking to that groove. Don't worry about the chord types like major or minor or dominant seven, just use the root notes that you see. So a C chord would be C, G7 is gonna be a G, okay? And the backing track's available at talkingbass.net along with the PDF of all the lesson material, okay? So there we have a bass line. 
it worked with the beat and it fit with the feel and the style, okay? So now we've tried using that bass drum as a guide, let's try a few different drum beats with different bass drum patterns and I'll use that same method of doubling the bass drum to uh, come up with a bass figure, okay? So um, you'll have two bars to hear the, the uh, bass drum figure and then I'll just play the first four bars of the uh, chord progression that we worked through, okay? Here we have the bass drum doubled at beat three. Here we'll introduce a 16th note into the beat. Now here's something a little more edgy. And now here's something a lot more syncopated. So each time we're just playing basic root notes and simply doubling the bass drum. So if you're ever stumped for something to play, just listen to the drummer. Now we can also create different feels by altering how we double those bass drum hits. At one extreme we can just play the notes and just let them ring out in a very legato fashion. So there's no silence between the notes, we just pluck, hold and pluck. So with that last beat that we played we'd end up with something like this. You can hear that this gives us a lazier, fuzzier vibe to the groove. The other extreme of this is to play the notes very staccato, which gives us a more excited or agitated feel. It can also highlight and accentuate the bass drums because we're matching the drum sustain more closely. We're also going to highlight the punch in the note because we're jumping in from silence rather than the drone or wash of the previous note. So that sounds like this. So there's obviously many different feels that we can create in between these two extremes by altering the note durations. By experimenting with the length of uh, the notes we can completely change the feel. Always be aware of the room that you're allowing that bass drum to breathe. Running smoothly from one note to another might work well for a ballad where we want a laid back kind of vibe, but we can generate more energy by allowing a bit of space before a note uh, in order to give it more punch and attack. If we go back to a simple drum beat with a dotted quarter eighth note bass drum, we can try out a few different feels. So we've got three notes to play with because we've got three bass drum hits per bar. So let's try first of all the two extremes. So first of all I'll just try holding the notes through. Now I'll try staccato. Okay, so you can hear how that's a completely different feel. Now let's try some combinations of those. So first of all, let's try just a, a staccato note for the final note. Now I'll try staccato for the second and the third. Now I'll try staccato first note and then hold the other two. Now I'll just try staccato first and second. Ok, 
okay? So you can hear how each one of those has got a completely different feel to the groove. So they were very extreme examples of this kind of legato or staccato playing. Um, but you're only really going to be using those in very specific circumstances, very specific types of groove. Whereas the majority of the time, you're probably going to be wanting to go for a more natural kind of feel. Okay, So to do this, we kind of go for the in-between uh, legato and staccato. So here's an example of using the, uh, f well, of playing the first and the last notes as quarter notes each, okay? So the first note is going to be held for a quarter note and then we'll have a gap of an eighth note. Then the third note is going to be for a, uh, a quarter note and a gap of a quarter note. Now, I'm obviously not going to be thinking like that. <laughs> uh, it's just going to be a case of cutting off uh, beats two and four. Also have a listen to where the snare drum is because we're going to be letting that breathe and really letting it cut through by stopping on those particular beats. So we're not getting in the way of the snare. Okay, so it'll make more sense as I play it. So here we go. Okay, so I'm cutting off on two and four. One, two, three. And listen to where the snare is. This time I'll play that same groove of holding for a quarter note for the first and third notes, but this time let's change the second note. So even though it's only a small, it only takes place for a small amount of time, either playing it legato or staccato can really change the feel of the groove. So, first of all staccato. Now legato. So those are all examples of how just changing the note durations in a groove can make a massive difference to the overall feel of a tune. Now I'm going to very quickly go over a specific type of bass line and that's the pop or rock pedal. Now again I've covered this quite heavily in the first bass riffs lesson because it's got that driving rhythm. Um, so now let's have a look at it as a basis for a standard bass line um, away from riffs. What I'm referring to as a pedal is simply a succession of eighth notes on a root note like this. Okay, so as you can hear, it's a really driving rhythm with a lot of conviction and it really serves to give a sense of propulsion to the bass line. And that's why it's the basis for so many classic rock bass lines. Now if we go back to the original chord progression and we just lay it down on that groove, we get the following. If we compare this with the previous method of doubling the bass drum, you can hear how it's got much more force and drive. Now that's not to say that it's a good thing or a bad thing, it all depends on what you're out to achieve and what fits with other aspects of the song, you know, like the rhythm guitar, vocal lines, lyrical content, the overall emotion uh, required of the song. Sometimes a song or instrumental will just write itself in this way. A pedal bass line might be perfect, especially if there's a pumping rhythm guitar line and sometimes it just won't fit or it might just seem too forceful. Sometimes it's much more appropriate to just double that bass drum. If you're playing a cover song that has a pedal line or you've been given a chord progression with a sample bass line or pedal indication, then it is just a case of pumping your way through those root notes. But don't think that's necessarily the easy option. The, these pedal lines can be quite incessant and they require you to nail the timing in just the same way as we did with the more sparse lines. Concentrate on hitting every note with good consistent time. 
Aim for each beat and use them as a constant update on your accuracy. If you get sloppy between the beats or on the up beats, then you'll be able to feel it when you come back on the down beats. If you want some help with timing accuracy, then I do have a lesson devoted to this uh, over at uh, TalkingBass.net or on the YouTube channel. Another important thing to work on in these pedal lines is your consistency of attack and your accent control. You should be able to keep every note at about the same volume without the need for a compressor. So this means concentrating on each finger as you hit the string and listening out for uh, sloppy accents. Try playing a simple pedal on a C here at the third fret of the A string and concentrate on keeping every note the same. So we don't want this. We want it to be more like this. Okay, so you don't want differences in volume. So let's start really slowly and listen to the difference in volume between the fingers and I'll be starting with the second finger, okay? So we'll take it really slow. Okay, so if, if we're starting with the second finger, let's say that that second finger is a lot stronger than the other and it's uh, a lot louder when we naturally play. So we might get something like this. Hear that pulsing. So now I need to bring the first finger up slightly to, to make it more consistent. Now let's say it's the other way around. Again, I'm starting with the second finger, but the first finger is, is louder. Okay, so I need to bring up the volume of the second finger. to make it more consistent. You then want to make sure that you can play consistently soft or hard or anything in between, okay? So here I am playing quite hard. Here's softer. Okay? So once we've achieved this consistent attack, we can start to take control of those accents and place them where we want. So let's first of all just try putting an accent on beats one and three, okay? So tempo one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, now let's try just beats two and four. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So now let's just try placing accents on the offbeat eighth notes, okay? So if we're starting on the second finger, then we're gonna be accenting with the first finger, okay? So we've got one, two, three, four. Now let's try uh, playing in groups of three, okay? So this time we're gonna be alternating the uh, finger that's uh, used for the accents. So one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Okay, so now for something completely different, let's try a bar of 4-4, four, four, but grouped 3-3-2, three, three, okay? So it's eight notes in all, and we're going to be playing them 3, 3, and then 2, which gives us this. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3
If you have control over where the accents are in the bar, then you're going to be able to really hone in on the groove a little better, rather than just you know mindlessly plodding away with unaccented eighth notes. So once you start looking a little deeper into groove in this way, um, what can seem like really straightforward on the face of it, you know, you begin to discover more and more aspects of the groove to address. When you look a little deeper into the timing of a groove in this way, eventually it leads you to looking at how a beat can be pushed or pulled. Now this is nothing to do with tempo, it's just where you place your notes in relation to the beat. Are they consistently in front of the beat and pushing the time, uh, you know, for a more energetic feel, or are they consistently behind the beat for a more laid back feel? There's an infinite number of placements uh, for your notes when you use your ear or mind as a musical microscope, and it can be really difficult to consciously place your bass notes where you want around that beat because, you know, you're dealing with such tiny levels of timing accuracy. One way to do this is to actually allow your body to take on the feel that's required act the feel and really allow your body to play that musical role. If it's pushing the beat, you don't just sit down in a chair or you know, start daydreaming about, you know, about what you're going to eat later on. Get on top of the beat and really work. Don't speed up, that's not what you want. You want to be at the same tempo, but each note wants to be at the front end of the beat. So imagine a car driving down the road. You could be sat in the driver's seat, that's more or less on the beat in a, in a neutral position. Now imagine sitting on the front of the bonnet, facing into the wind, you know, and shouting encouragement back to your driver. That's pushing the beat. Same speed, but on the front tip of the beat. Now imagine sitting tired or sleeping at the back of the car. The car's moving at the same speed, but you're just relaxed and going with the flow, you know, at the back of the beat. Now, I know that's more of an analogy, um, and it's, you know, really hard to create that feel at the click of someone's fingers. But one of the best ways to do it, as I mentioned, is to just try and internalize that feel, as opposed to, you know, just the tempo or rhythm. It's the feel that you want to internalize. If you want to push, open your eyes, move around and literally push the beat. If you want to lay back, feel it, relax your muscles, maybe sit down, musically chill out. That way you can create the feel naturally as an extension of yourself rather than as a dedicated attempt to, you know, robotically quantize in yourself. So there's also a few other little things that we can uh, do with this pedal. One of them is a trick that I picked up off Billy Sheehan. When playing these type of grooves, he'll always hold his hand in an octave uh, pan and put octave hits on the snare beats. Not always, but often it can help to break up the monotony of the line while locking in more with the kit, so it gives you more of an accent. So instead of this, we now have this. Okay? You can also use fills to add interest to these kind of beats. Uh, I'll also be covering fills with the other lines in later lessons, but pedal lines are a perfect way to introduce them. So uh, when looking at fills, try to think like a drummer. Drummers uh, use fills to signify changes in a piece of music, so moving from a verse into a chorus, or a chorus into a verse, or maybe a big modulation to a different key, or even just at the end of a four or eight bar section. So fills serve to indicate to the listener and the other musicians that, yes, we've finished that bit, here's the other bit, or here's the next bit. But it's not just drummers that can get in on that fun. We're also a part of the rhythm section, so it can be useful to play a fill to help bolster that movement, okay? So it also helps add some interest to the bass line, especially if it's an incessant pedal. So as an example, let's take a rock uh, beat for four bars with a drum fill like this. Okay, so we've got a drum fill there at the end. So I'm just going to take a really basic uh, chord progression that would uh, possibly be at the end of a section. So I'm going to have C, F, C, G, okay? So that would sound like this. So now let's try a really basic fill. All I'm going to do is shoot up the octave, okay? So you'll hear how that sounds. Okay, so 
Okay, so again, it's the same rhythm, but that higher octave just indicates that something's happening. Now we'll try a fill using that same rhythm, but I'll try something a little bit more melodic by just introducing the notes of the chord, and the chord being a G7. Okay, so that'll sound like this. So that fill got a lot more attention because it was up here at the octave, but I could have just played the same thing down the octave. So that would sound like this. I could also try a fill with a little bit more rhythmic interest, like this. If you already know what drum fill the drummer's going to play, or you just have a really good connection with them and you pretty much know what's coming, you could try doubling that drum fill, okay? So this time I'll use a G Mixolydian scale over the G7, so I'm going to have a bit more scale uh, material to use, and you get something like this. So if you're playing in a fairly free and open band setting with a lot of room for experimenting with stuff like this, you can find yourself developing almost a, a psychic connection with other players in the group as you play almost identical things together on the fly. Now even though it can seem like ESP, it's more that you get to know a little about the idiosyncrasies of each other's playing, uh, both rhythmically and melodically, and it's like being in a long-term intimate relationship with someone when you just know each other so well uh, that you know what the other's going to say before they say it. So I'll leave it there for this lesson and get more into some of the other styles and ways of working around a groove in the next lesson of the series. If you're watching this on YouTube, then please like this video, leave a comment, and subscribe to get regular updates on new lessons. Also, go on over to TalkingBass.net for more articles, lessons, and downloads. If you subscribe, you can download my free scale reference guide. Okay, see you later.